Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. PSENG, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Tonight on NJTV News, a very candid Cory Booker talks life after ending his presidential run and impeaching the president. I don't care how partisan you are, we should all have an allegiance, a fealty to the truth in our nation. Don't let your partisanship blind you to the urgency of this process. Plus, Senator Loretta Weinberg announces the group of women who will lead the change on the toxic culture of misogyny in New Jersey politics. As high as our rates of autism are here in New Jersey, they're missing many kids who should be diagnosed. But why? And the fight to help save newborns exposed to opioids on this Maternal Health Awareness Day. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark. This is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us on air and online. It's day three of the prosecution of the president on charges that Donald Trump abused his power and obstructed Congress. Among the 100 senators sitting as jurors in the historic trial is New Jersey's Cory Booker, who shares with our senior correspondent David Cruz lessons from his recently ended presidential campaign and a look into the impeachment proceedings. Last time I saw you, you were running for a car in Exeter, New Hampshire. Uh, a lot of people thought that you would stay in this race through uh, Iowa. You had the resources to do that, didn't you? Why didn't you? Well, we said very plainly that we were going to stay in. I'm not in this for a vanity play. We're in it to win it. And when we saw sort of uh, that perfect storm in January of uh, not making the debate stage because of rules, frankly, that uh, are very broken. I mean, there was somebody on the debate stage that we were polling ahead of in Iowa. Uh, when we saw that I was going to have to be here in the Senate for days, if not weeks, for this impeachment trial. And that because of that, we needed even more resources to be up on TV and do the things that a lot of the more resource campaigns and billionaires are able to do. We saw our, our wide pathway to winning in Iowa beginning to, to close quickly. And I had made that point very clear that uh, I'm in this to win it. If we don't have a pathway, I'm not dragging all of my supporters and uh, um, activists and others uh, through this just to stay in it. Uh, this is about beating Donald Trump. Uh, I still believe we were the best candidate in the field to do that. But if we couldn't win in those early primary states, we shouldn't be in it. Did your, was your message not uh, well received or received sufficiently? I remember back in February on your front porch when um, you announced, you said very pointedly, love is hard. It is. Look, I, I appreciate that question. I, I think, and, and now we're starting to do the postmortem, we had this challenge where this message to understand that we are a nation that must heal, that beating Donald Trump is is, is the floor, not the ceiling. It's, it gets us out of a valley, but it doesn't get us to the mountaintop. To get to that mountaintop, we have a, as a country have to create new American majorities and affirm that the lines that divide us are not as strong as the ties that bind us. That message, when we were able to be on the ground connecting with people, was wildly successful. We had reporters and others say they've never seen standing ovations in stump speeches like we got, uh, a commitment to caucus cards at the degree we got. But that was a, a, a strategy. We had to run a grassroots campaign. And so uh, other people whose message is different, uh, their TV commercials and more, had the money and the resources to do that. When we started seeing our ability to hit the grassroots, to connect with people, being cut off for a lot of reasons we couldn't control, um, we knew that that we weren't going to be able to, to get that right stuff out there. So I actually believe this is the message America needs right now. We need to understand that we are not each other's enemy, that, that, that ultimately, yeah, I want to beat Donald Trump, put Mitch McConnell back to the back benches. But that is not about that kind of conflict that often people think. A lot of that is actually inspiring more Americans to get engaged in the process. 
As King said, that the problem we have to repent for is not the vitriolic words and violent actions of bad people, it's the appalling silence and inaction of good people. We need an inspiring leader that can call to the moral imagination of our country to get more people engaged, because to be able to do the big stuff like climate change, scientists say we need like a World War II type mobilization. To, well, let me to, ask you to this, be, then. The, you yeah, say just, you that, need a big leader. Um, is that leader part of the pack of Democrats still running right now? Well, look, I, I've had very personal conversations on the Senate floor with a lot of my colleagues, from people running to people not, and have that affirmation. One of the great experiences I've had uh, this year was just the period from uh, about a Monday or so ago that I dropped out of the race. And, and the, what I'm hearing from colleagues and others, you know, as one senator put it to me, you guys had the, a message that America really needs. It's a shame that in this primary process, it wasn't wanted by enough people for us to pop. So I believe that we are, a pendulum has swung in this country to a president that almost takes joy out of his meanness and his uh, cruelty uh, as degrading people. I, I believe that there's gonna come a time where the yearning of our nation will be back towards civility, towards working together. The next president, and I've had this conversation, they're gonna have to be a healer. They're going to have to pe understand that we can't. There's no Democrat or Republican way. I'm to sorry to interrupt you, Senator, but my, that's my question: Is that person still out there on on the Democratic stage? Um, I I believe that that person that person is there. We all have a potential to be that person. Let's stop making conclusions about each other. Let's actually be part of the solution and inspiring each other to be that kind of leader. Because we don't need one leader. I said the whole campaign. It's not about me. It's about we. The beauty of King, whose celebration we just had, the beauty of Martin Luther King uh, was uh, his ability to inspire and engage other people in a movement, to make them understand that they have a role to play, that they must lead. That's where we are right now with gun violence, prescription drug costs too high. These aren't right or left issues. In order to make this change, we need inspiring leadership that's going to activate and engage more people. And yeah, I believe they're on that stage. And yes, I believe they're listening to you right now. All of us have a responsibility to play. Nothing will change unless I we feel, rise. I feel like you're still me. running, uh, Senator. Usually I, I don't even get these many opportunities to interrupt you. But I know you have actual I, Senate business. I'm running for United States Senate in New Jersey, yes. and I'm proud of that. Let me ask you quickly. Because I know you have, yes. uh, you, you've got deadlines today. This impeachment uh, process, it feels like the worst jury duty ever because you're, you've got to listen to all this information again, but you know pretty much what the jury's going to decide. Well, I tell you, it's the worst jury duty ever because I can't imagine going to, a, to be a juror and basically having it announced that, uh, that we're not going to have any witnesses in a trial. I mean, this is stunning. And that many of the relevant documents that are critical, I think, for helping my Republican colleagues see this fact pattern are being denied. I mean, even Nixon was 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 turning over documents. Uh, um, but this is a president that's stonewalling completely every impeachment trial. We've had impeachment trials of presidents and judges. Every one of the 15, there have been witnesses averaging uh, somewhere around 10 or so witnesses. This is insane that we are literally going through a trial right now where some of the documents, which we know are not classified, which we know would confirm what a lot of the people who have given testimony in the House would confirm what they're saying. This is, should be insulting to the American people. And by the way, if Mick Mulvaney came down, he could either be an exculpatory witness under oath and just say, deny all the allegations, or frankly, he'd be a damning witness. What are we afraid of? Why are we afraid of the truth? Why is the president of the United States not allowing key people who are relevant fact witnesses from coming before the United States Senate and this jury? So, so what's that's the what I'm impact do you think going to be on the American public after this show trial in reverse is done? Well, I actually think that one of the more compelling things that uh, the House managers have said, which is the true thing about time, is that most of these documents, I don't know if it's 10 years from now, 25 years from now, the next president might just release everything. This is all going to come out. It, it is. And, and this president's uh, uh, actions are going to be revealed to the world. The shame is, is that we have, we have people in the United States Senate right now who don't want to know the truth.
who Dude. don't want it laid bare before the American people. I don't care how partisan you are. We should all have an allegiance, a fealty to the truth in our nation. These are constitutional ideals. This president is not a monarch. He is not a dictator. He is subject to the law, as every American is. Our Constitution was designed with three co-equal branches of government. And this president, for the first time breaking with American history, is basically saying, I am not accountable to any checks and balances. I am not accountable for releasing the truth. We now have the, the, the Government uh, Accountability Office, the GAO, has said factually that he has violated the law. This is an independent agency. I haven't always agreed with what they've said, but they are independent. And they have said that this president has violated the law in withholding those resources that were bipartisanly approved by Congress. Come on now, let's get to the truth and not go through uh, uh, what I think right now, we still don't know the, the definitive no witness call is gonna be made at the end of this trial. But if that happens, every American should just be insulted. Don't let your partisanship blind you to the urgency of this process, the sanctity of the Constitution and constitutional principles that are also on trial in a sense right now. All right, New Jersey Senator Cory Booker, good to see you again, man. Thanks very much for the time. Thank you, it's good to see you too. You can watch PBS NewsHour's coverage of the impeachment trial live every day on our website, njtvnews.org. Tackling Trenton's toxic culture. That's the goal of Senate Majority Leader Loretta Weinberg as she takes on a history of harassment, sexual assault, and misogyny in New Jersey politics. Today, her work group laid out its plans to reverse years of mistreatment for women in our state. Senior correspondent Brianna Venosi has a story. This is a warning. If you are actively intimidating, harassing, and assaulting women, we will find out who you are and there are systems to deal with that. A clear message from some of the state's top female leaders. Those who prey on New Jersey women in politics should prepare for a culture shift. This is the beginning of change. And we are going to change the things that will bring a spotlight onto the things we think need change. Senate Majority Leader Loretta Weinberg unveiled the work group that'll tackle issues of misogyny in state politics. It's a cross-section of female leaders with backgrounds in policy, campaigns, and lobbying. Today, they detailed concrete steps for action, starting with statewide listening sessions, both public and private, for workers to come forward with their experiences. And the New Jersey Coalition Against Sexual Assault has created an anonymous online survey on misogyny and sexual misconduct conduct in New Jersey politics, which will serve as a vehicle through which data can be shared that really centers the lived experiences of our colleagues in government and politics. That survey can be found at njcasa.org slash njpolitics. Patricia Teffenhart says the survey will be widely distributed during the annual chamber train trip to Washington. It's one of the marquee political events highlighted in the Star-Ledger report that unveiled the toxic climate of sexual harassment and spurred the creation of this group. We are prepared. If women are not supported, then women are not going to continue to blindly support men who will not step up and take some leadership on this issue. Part of the working group will focus on helping young women still rising in their career. Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver said today, Trenton's atmosphere has been filled with decades of discrimination and overt sexual assault against women. We create group texts to check in with our colleagues at conventions and conferences. We never walk alone or accept drinks from anyone but ourselves. Our God guard is constantly up. They are free to come forward because there is a consistent pattern of powerful men calling members of the media and off the record or on background spreading toxic information about them. Julie Reginsky was a top aide to Governor Phil Murphy during his 2017 bid. Her time on the trail and abrupt ending have been the source of controversy over non-disclosure agreements. Just this week, Reginsky received a letter from Murphy's attorney clearing her to air grievances about her time with the campaign. She called it one of the most toxic environments during her 25 years of political work.
I do admit there was some confusion, which I frankly still don't know that I understand why there was confusion. But we felt like, you know what, let's clear this up definitively once and for all. This working group is fluid, so you can expect to see more members joining and more items added to the mission statement. As for that anonymous survey, the first round of preliminary data should be ready by mid-March, but the members here agreed that it will be difficult to get folks to come forward with their stories. They have more work to do. In Newark, Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. One of the state's fiercest fighters for affordable housing has been nominated to head the state's watchdog agency. Rhonda Schaffler has that story and more. Rhonda. Mary Alice, Governor Murphy has nominated Kevin Walsh to the position of comptroller. Walsh has been serving as executive director of the Fair Share Housing Center, where he aggressively went after communities which failed to provide affordable housing as required by law. If his nomination is approved, Walsh would have financial oversight of all aspects of New Jersey's government. He would be armed with the ability to conduct audits and investigations on state agencies and authorities. One of the most important features of the comptroller's position is its independence. My job will be to demand answers and speak truthfully about waste, fraud, corruption, and inefficiency. Walsh would fill his seat left vacant when former Comptroller Philip Degnan was confirmed to serve on the state superior court. For more on this story, check out tomorrow's report from John Reitmeyer on NJ Spotlight. New Jersey companies continued their hiring streak in December. Preliminary estimates show New Jersey's workforce expanded by 6,500 positions last month. Most of the jobs were created in the private sector. Two industries in particular were staffing up. That's leisure and hospitality and professional and business services. 2019 marked the 10th straight year of job growth in the state. New Jersey's unemployment rate now stands at 3.5%, a slight uptick over the prior month. Last fall, Jersey City residents overwhelmingly approved a referendum to regulate Airbnb rentals. At the same time, Airbnb hosts in the city were cashing in. Airbnb says Jersey City was the most popular destination in the state for visitors last year. More money was made by hosts in Hudson County than anywhere else, a total of $75 million. You may not have heard of the North Atlantic right whale. It's an endangered species living off the coast of New Jersey in the same area that Orsted U.S. Offshore Wind is planning to build a wind farm. So Orsted, an underwriter of NJTV News, is planning to team up with academia, including Rutgers University, to study the whale's habitat. The goal is to protect the species during construction work and subsequent operation of the wind farm. On Wall Street, a mix close for today. The Dow lost 26 points. And those are your top business stories. On this Maternal Health Awareness Day, First Lady Tammy Murphy has announced a strategic plan to improve the odds for mothers and babies in a state that ranks 47th in the nation in maternal mortality. She also announced a partnership to help cut the death rate in half by tackling the vast racial disparities, not just in health care, but in access to housing, healthy food, quality child care, and education. The goal, our goal, is to make New Jersey the safest place in the United States to deliver a baby, period. Mothers who've used opioids or related drugs during pregnancy can give birth to babies who can suffer violent withdrawal symptoms. The rates of the potentially fatal neonatal abstinence syndrome have doubled in New Jersey over the last decade. Leah Mishkin found new protocols now in place that can be life-saving. They're shaking, their vital signs uh, are out of whack, their heart rate is up, um, and it can be a life-threatening condition. These are some of the symptoms babies face if they're exposed to opioids in the womb. The baby becomes dependent on the drug. So those symptoms are actually the newborn going through withdrawal. It's a condition known as neonatal abstinence syndrome, or NAS. Most hospitals don't have a standardized protocol to screen a mother for an opioid addiction. So once she gives birth, the baby goes home. The problem is withdrawal happens two to three days after birth. There's no history, there's no diagnosis, 
There's no lab confirmation that there was drug in the system. Babies who are exposed to drugs in the womb are at a higher risk of sudden infant death, seizures, and are at a higher risk of becoming children who suffer from cognitive problems in school and behavioral problems like antisocial tendencies. These kids then grow up and they become like very delinquent. They, they, they don't fit well in, and then they start having all this drug experimentation. University Hospital has developed a standard set of protocols for staff to identify and treat a baby with NAS. The maternal screening criteria includes fewer than eight prenatal visits, a history with Child Protective Agency, or has multiple STDs. They're medical indications of high risk behavior, so Dr. Ali says they can test urine for drugs. I wish it could be universal. The reason they can't? It's complicated. If someone doesn't fit the screening criteria, drug testing without consent can be a problem. The demographic has changed a lot, okay? So it used to be minority, inner city, like kind of problem, okay? So if now, it is actually the suburban, educated, Caucasian, insured mothers who are going to private obstetricians and things, and they have a lot of pull. Dr. Ali explains there's no mandate requiring universal drug screenings as of now. She says with the change of demographics affected by the opioid crisis, the majority of women who may have an NAS baby are not being tested. Neonatal abstinence syndrome, unfortunately, is a condition that has grown a lot over time. In the last 15 years, uh, we've seen about a five-fold increase uh, or even more, at least in New Jersey, and we're seeing similar increases uh, across the country. And so this is a problem that policymakers can't ignore, certainly pediatricians can't ignore, and we hope that this is a solution that will help uh, mothers and babies across the state. The NAS program at University Hospital also keeps track of the babies, sometimes up until they're six years old. We keep an eye on their nutritional status, on their developmental status. Nature versus nurture ultimately plays a big role. If the baby is in a more nurturing environment, I think in my personal opinion, brain is plastic enough to, to overcome whatever was exposed in there. Okay? So there is light, you know, if, if we have proper program, proper treatment, proper support system, I think we will have a much better outcome. In Newark, I'm Leah Mishkin for NJTV News. One in 34 children in New Jersey is diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. The CDC says that's the highest rate in the nation. But a Rutgers researchers found those numbers don't come close to telling the whole story. There appears to be racial disparity when diagnosing kids. Here's Joanna Gagas. A quarter, 25% of all the children with autism we identified did not have an autism diagnosis by age eight. A new report shows a surprising disparity in the number of kids who display the criteria for autism spectrum disorder but have no diagnosis. So according to the DSM criteria, child would have to have a certain number of social impairment and communication impairment features as well as uh, anomalies of behavior or repetitive behavior. Rutgers University's Walter Zaharadny contributed to the report put out by the Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network. The report analyzed the medical and school records of nearly 5,500 children. But when the researchers drilled down into who these undiagnosed children are, it became clear there's a major disparity around race. All minority children, black, Hispanic, Asian, are less likely to be diagnosed with autism than their white peers, than white children. So that's an important, very obvious disparity, which is very surprising to find uh, in 2019 or 2020. The research didn't explore why these disparities exist, so we reached out to social justice and healthcare advocacy organizations around the state, but there doesn't seem to be much focus on this issue, perhaps part of the reason why these kids are being left behind. Zaha Rodney says educating the parents is a critical next step. From zero to three, I'd say it's always going to be the family with the pediatrician or family practitioner. That's the first line of defense, first line of identification. Once the child gets to be school age, which is anywhere over age three, the school system, once local school system gets to play a role. And usually if there's a, a halfway decent school system, the child's exposed to uh, evaluations in that period, they'll be identified and provided services. 
But Zaha Rodney believes researchers are missing another major area, a study of the environmental causes that he believes are contributing to the high rates of autism, especially in New Jersey. He says that's the next frontier in beginning to better understand this disorder. I'm Joanna Gagas, NJTV News. We've had a death in the family. PBS NewsHour co-founder Jim Lehrer has died. His was a steadying voice through 36 tumultuous years, two dozen of them as co-anchor of the McNeil Lehrer Report. Jim was a legend and a leader to generations of young journalists. Jim Lehrer was 85. Tomorrow on NJTV News, why is money to improve the 9-11 emergency system being siphoned off by the state? To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams, and we'll see you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. The Orsted vision is a world that runs entirely on green energy. Located off the coast of Atlantic City, Orsted's Ocean Wind Project will provide renewable offshore wind energy, jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Orsted, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey.